how are we going to use data both uh, on student retention, student pathways, and on how we teach and you know what, what works and what doesn't. So for this session, I wanted to start by saying um, one question that somebody raised for me in the break this morning that followed on from one of the morning sessions, and also to say it'd be great if we can be as granular and example driven as possible so that we help people to, you know, to really get to grips with what we're talking about here. So the question was that somebody said to me outside, you know, there's an inherent tension here between the sort of personalization that data can give you and the sort of standardization that you get when you try and do courses at a very big scale. Um, could I ask each of you to sort of you know, take that as your starting point and just give me an immediate reaction to this? I mean, do you see a tension at all between standardization and, and sort of uh, personalization? Or do you think that this is a... So I don't think it's necessarily standardization versus personalization. I think to what Adrian was saying at lunch, it's about how do we effectively scale right. and drive great outcomes? Because right? the, the beginning point of all of this is how do we help our young people and our people who are returning back to college succeed? And that's the way we create the greatest value. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, uh, the area of inquiry starts with if we're going to deliver high quality education at scale, how do we do it in ways that keep that student on that road of success? Keep them from getting frustrated, keep them from getting bored, and keep them as engaged, confident learners. And I think if that's the starting point, then there is no tension. It's about pedagogically valid designs. It's about bringing that teacher and student close together, whether it's face-to-face -face or mediated through technology. And it's about allowing that student, who is very much time-starved like all of us, to maximize the productivity of that educational moment, whether it's practice solo, whether it's working in a group for um, competency-based or participant-centered learning. On, on the sort of granular level, is there an example that comes to mind that sort of absolutely. illustrates this for you? So absolutely. So if, if anybody's looked at education at all, we recognize that math is a significant challenge to most, most of our learners. And there's this notion, fear of math. And what that really means is that the way many of our young people are taught math today is through rote memorization, or historically has been, I should say. Yeah. But if we can take the concept of, say, an algebra class, if we can dissect it into, say, 400 pieces of knowledge and areas of inquiry that they have to be comfortable and competent in, and if we can structure that scope and sequence in a way that allows them to feel engaged and successfully progress, they succeed. Mm -hmm. And so through technology today, we can do just that. We can build a pedagogy that's per, that allows them to go on this personalized course of inquiry, that allows them to tackle small bit after small bit successfully. We can engage them in ways that are very interactive and very engaging and frankly make math fun. I know you think I'm crazy, but it's true. And then we can use that information to empower their professor, be it a large or small section, to understand how's that student doing when they engage me via email or in office hours. We can allow that tutor to engage a smaller group of students to focus that tutorial session. And so we're allowed to have both scale and personalization by doing these in ways that really instrument the learning moment. So David, do you see a tension between personalization and standardization? Or? Um, I think it's a false dichotomy. I, I think um, you need to have both. Yeah. And uh, the, way I, the way I look at it is, uh, you need to have standards. You need to have standards. You need to have um, what people would agree on in terms of what people need to learn um, at every stage of um, your educational career. Um, but we don't need to feed everyone the exact same course of of, uh, of content or or, or of uh, the syllabus. And so um, standards can be personalized. And everyone taking their, uh, making their way through that, that course of study can find their own personalized path within, within, those, uh, within those guardrails. And I think that's what gets, gets lost. When we talk about um, standards or content or education, a lot of times you, get, you, you have the conversation where people talk about, well, this is the best content. This is the best teacher. This is the best, 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 best. And really, when it, when it comes down to the individual learner, um, what you find to be best for you, not only academically, but from an from a outcomes-driven perspective, your ability to, to learn it and then apply that knowledge is different from what I might find to be the best. And so that this, um, there's a misnomer around what's, what's best or what's the standard. 
Brent, I wanted to ask you, um, the examples that people give, and this has been noticeable today, but it's been noticeable to me also whenever I talk about education, it does tend to be in mathematics or in the hard sciences. I mean, is any of this either long-term relevant or at the moment being put into practice in, you know, I don't know, in language teaching or in, you know, the liberal arts type education? Can, can you take that approach of like breaking it down into 400 things that people need to know? And sure. So is there long-term relevancy for it? Certainly. Uh, yeah. the, this is about uh, the idea of being able on scale to use the technology to help you build more of that personalized learning experience, more of that personalized path through your institution that allows the student to continue to be engaged and continue to be uh, connected to the institution. I think part of the reason why uh, you're seeing that a lot of the efforts initially focus around uh, particularly math, but some of the other uh, foundational STEM courses is because those are courses where traditionally in higher ed, there are, are uh, gateway courses. There, there are make or break courses where we have our highest DFW rates for students. They're the ones where that are often trigger courses where if you see a student is struggling in that course, it means something in terms of what they need to do uh, for future major or, mm. or future efforts uh, uh, with their, their educational moment. I think that's part of why there's a lot of that focus right now. Because those, those have been the courses that have been very tough nuts to crack right. uh, uh, for higher education. So I, um, a lot of people said to me during the break as well that it was nice that I asked so many questions, I got so many questions from the audience. And what I said to them was I was getting great questions. And also the people who were here are all experts. So, you know, they're very high level questions. So I'm gonna immediately ask, does anyone want to chip in here and ask our panelists a question on the theme? Everyone's soporific after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody has to have had two cups of coffee after lunch. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Um, um, is there a danger that we're, um, if, not, if not standardizing, is there a danger that we're um, closing in too much on what we mean by success by looking at data? I mean, you know, what, what gets measured gets managed. Everybody knows that. So, you know, if we're saying that what matters to us, well, if, if what matters is that people don't drop out, I think that matters to everybody. That's great. You know, if they complete, that's, that's meaningful. But, you know, if we're measuring how much they end up going on and getting paid or that sort of thing, that isn't necessarily people who are happy, people who are productive, people who are giving a contribution to society, that sort of thing. Are, are we at risk of losing things that are harder to measure? So my point of view is if those were the measures we solely focused in on, we would fundamentally change what education is and not for the better. Mm. Certainly those measures have a place and some of the new measures we're seeing of universities have a role. But what we were just talking about really I think was small data. And I think we were talking about data in the learning moment that allows a strengthening of that relationship between student, instructor, course, and discipline. And so I think it's the opposite. I think by doing that, we're actually empowering that student to grow in ways we couldn't imagine. We're empowering that teacher who may be doing three or four preps in a semester to more thoughtfully think about that next course session or that next week online or that next study group or that next email that he or she responds to. I mean, imagine being able to meet your student when they're coming to you for help, having a deeper understanding of their strengths and their weaknesses and their areas where they need to drive deeper into and channeling that conversation in a way that engages them. Is there anyone on the panel or in the audience who's tried doing anything in the way of a, an RCT, a randomized control trial, using different approaches and actually like run an experiment? No? Yeah, there's a hand tentatively considering going up here. Wait, well, wait until you have a mic. Yeah, I had a question, but I'll answer your question. Oh, just wait until we have a mic to you because it's hard to hear. Could you also stand up? I, mean, I was asked to remind people to do that. It's for the video. It's not so that you know you feel too self-conscious. Uh, Dave Jarrett with Inside Track. So I'll plant my questions first, and then I'll okay. answer yours. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the use of big data to support student success outside of academics. Okay. Because we know that, that many of the reasons they drop out are non-academic. And then also an issue that was brought up earlier where data, uh, data in general, data analysis is telling us which students are at risk of failing, but a little bit less about why and what to do about it. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how we can apply data to figure out which interventions work best. Um, and then the answer to your question, uh, there have there have definitely been randomized controlled trials on a variety of different student success 
um, initiatives, and I think a number of them are proving uh, quite promising. But I think the challenge you have is that they um, they vary situationally quite a bit depending on the demographics of the students, the type of institution, and so the challenge is in institutions finding the right interventions for their students. Mm -hmm. And then also getting students engaged with those. I think there's a lot of effort and resources put into uh, student support resources that don't get utilized because the means of engaging the student isn't effective. So for example, um, if you're expecting a student to walk into an office, that's not gonna happen. But if you can find a way to engage them via a text message or a mobile app, Mm -hmm. and then get them drawn into that support process, that will make it much more effective. But, but even then, you know, how you word the text message when you send it, what the triggers are for it and things like that, these are things that are potentially you know, up there for proper experimental design. Right, and, and those are the things that you have to do that experimentation around. So uh, I talked about in, in the, the morning session that uh, what really, where the real benefit out of this and where the real drive will come from are those interventions and those programmatic efforts you make based upon this increased data that you know mm -hmm. about the student, about their, uh, where they are in, in their path. And it's, so if all we do is we end at, we know we have a student that maybe is falling off path here, then we've completely failed. In, in the in the effort. So it's a matter about crafting that, that intervention. And then you've got to do experimentation around that to figure out uh, what are the the, uh, the points that work best in that. Um, and getting at the idea of uh, completely randomized uh, design. While we haven't done a lot of complete randomized designs, it's been more quasi-experimental. You're seeing more of that now. In fact, uh, we're a part of the University Innovation Alliance uh, at, at Purdue with uh, uh, 10 other institutions. And uh, we just received a first in the world grant to look at a completely randomized design around um, an advising model based upon these academic triggers that we've talked about. And we're, bo we're borrowing a lot of the infrastructure for how, for how we'll do this from what Georgia State has already done in the space and has had remarkable success with mm. their students with. And we're looking about how we can do that at scale across all 11 of these institutions. And we're doing it with a completely randomized uh, control design That's with really it. That's really exciting. So. Yeah. I mean, on the, the question about using data from outside the classroom, which is, I think, what you were saying, you know, on other sorts of information, I mean, what sort of things were you imagining, like? Well, just in general, you look, uh, I happen to work with an organization that uh, has a lot of data on dropouts. About 80% of the dropouts are either not financed. Yeah, so this is to do with financing, I guess, and uh, family situations? It's, uh, I don't feel like I fit in at this university. It, right. I have the right time management. So okay. I'm, I'm a Bible of Tinto guy, so I'm all about academic and social integration. Um, and that's why a lot of what we focus on, are, on our efforts have been about that engagement of the student with the institution and how well they're integrating to the institution and the behavioral markers you can see of that from, from the data so that when you see a student that seems to be falling off track there, you can have uh, uh, an advisor have a conversation with them about uh, are they having trouble? Do they feel like they're not fitting in? Are there areas where they could maybe fit in better with the campus? So. I mean, there, there are just really fundamental issues that, that we are not solving for today. And, and when we're talking about whether or not um, you know, students can, can think critically and, and, and have problem solving skills and, and, um, and, and do all of these things that, that we think that they should get out of it, uh, an education in higher ed, um, we're, we're missing a little bit of the fundamentals, which are if, if I am struggling with being able to just do my homework and turn it in the next week because I don't understand, I'm completely lost, I, I don't understand how any of these students can actually do all of the other things that we're, we're asking of them. And they're coming to school, coming to, to um, college totally unprepared. So this is a K-12 issue as much as it is a higher ed issue. We're trying to solve a lot of these things in, in higher ed when they should be solved in K-12. We're now in 20 different countries, and, and the stark differences that I see in the education systems aren't about top-down versus bottoms-up or, or mandates that come from the government versus um, 
districts doing their own thing. They really come from the philosophy of how early can you get in front of the student and engage them and make sure that they're actually learning what they're supposed to be learning and then they can apply it and not learn to game a test. Mm -hmm. And we have you know, this massive testing culture that's, that's emerging here. That's, that is actually something that we're seeing all around the world. But if you're not able to fundamentally take care of the, fun, the, the fundamentals of learning, understanding the basics of math and science and reading and writing, what hope do you have of being able to innovate, being able to think broader, being able to talk about strategy? You are literally just trying to keep your head above water. And the kids who are actually doing well are absolutely bored because, again, you have to teach to that mean. It's yes. the one-size-fits-all situation of scaling education that is, um, that's almost like it's the double whammy. You know? so I think this is where this tension comes in. I mean, it, you, you're so right, both of you, when you said that you know, it's, it's, shouldn't, it, it's a false dichotomy between standardization and personalization. It shouldn't be there, but it kind of is. And one of the reasons is because you know, our desire to have data on what's working has driven this testing culture. And the testing culture means that the outcomes often are, you know, how many people did I get past this particular sure. boundary? The and then straight away you're talking about trying to get, you know, 70% or 80% just across that line, and now you're back to something that's very standardized. So I do see this testing culture as having been driven by something which was, you know, fundamentally a good idea, like let's get data on outcomes and let's use that data to hold people to account. But, but to your point, it's a false proxy. Yeah, it is a false right, So proxy, high stakes, uh, moment in time, summative examinations are not going to keep kids in college, are not going to prepare them in K-12 to go into college. And so it's almost not worth making that the center of this conversation today. What's more interesting, I think, is what you're hearing both from the question of the audience and from the responses is to do this well, it's a yes and. If I don't feel comfortable on my campus, if I'm a first generation and I don't even know what it means to go register, what it means to go to the student center, if I don't actually feel comfortable, if I'm on campus, most aren't, but if I'm living with a roommate and it's not working, if it's not a safe environment, you've lost me. So you need these macro indicators and you need really compassionate human advisors who can use them to create community. And then to the other part of the conversation, when I'm in that learning moment, keep me engaged and use that data to both drive my one-on-one -on -one learning and my community-based learning. And if we do both, the students are successful. Unfortunately, we're in a moment in time where it's getting much easier to do that. We have standards such as Caliper from IMS Global, which is creating a moment in time when we can truly share learner data for the right purpose in ways that are easier to share it, to get it to the people who should have access to it, to lower the cost of doing these great trials that you just talked about, to the lower the cost of being a data-driven community, and to use it for good purpose. And I think that's really exciting. I have two questions over here, one at the back and then one at the front. So I'll take both of them and then go, go to the panelists. I'm really challenged by the notion of using our students' learning data that they give to us through their learning process, right, as our customers, and then putting it into a randomized study mostly because we have to not treat somebody. And we know damn well that non-treatment is worse than anything else we could do. Yeah. And so I real, you know, the First in the World grant that was out and all the different RFPs that require that kind of setup, I really worry about the ethics about that. So if you could address that, that'd be interesting. I'll take the question from the front as well. Uh, just right in the corner at the front, yeah. Thank you, uh, Cliff Turoni with Temple University. I'm wondering, too, um, to what extent you're capturing, we've talked about a number of variables as students go through courses. To what extent are you systematically capturing variables beyond just logging into LMSs that speak to the modality of the course? So like duration, was it a take home or in class? Um, was it a homework or was it a case study? And that you're looking at that level of analysis in terms of how students learn best in terms of delivery of information. Thank you both. On the RCT one, maybe I should have said more like an A-B trial where you know you honestly don't know which of two ways to do something is going to work out best. So you're not, not treating some people. You're, you're trying two different ways to do it and see which of those ends up better. And I mean, actually, it's not ethical to not do that sort of thing. You know, to stick with something without checking whether it works is the least ethical thing you can do, I think. Right. So it's probably my fault for putting it the wrong way. I'm not saying let's just leave some people not taught 
and choose those ones, you know, randomly. Um, I mean, if one of you wants to answer on that too, sure, but maybe we, we can sort of focus uh, I, on the second one. I was going to answer the second one. So yeah, please, do you want to do that? Yeah, so what we're looking at at Newton is we're, we are looking at every piece of, um, uh, we, we call it um, prof proficiency data. And so this is the data that, that not only from uh, uh, students' performance on assessments, but also um, the type of instructional uh, data that they're actually uh, going through. So what video they watch, how long did they, they spend in learning that piece of content, um, what questions they missed, and how did they miss them. Um, yes, modality. What types of uh, content are they are they absorbing? So, so for us, the more granular that data is, the, the better. We are um, trying to get to student uh, improving student outcomes on a concept by concept basis, um, and and almost in real time. And it's amazing. We're in an amazing time right now where we can finally leverage all of the technological advances that we've all been using in many other industries that have not really touched um, education fundamentally at a student by student, concept by concept level. So um, this is not about recommending the next course that I take necessarily, although we can use it for that. This is about, as I'm going through the learning process, am I really understanding and getting to the root of the problem as a student? Is the technology helping me discover that for myself and then I can go into it and, and solve it and get that aha moment more systematically, less randomly? And certainly teachers can and, and professors and instructors are a huge component of this because when they have this data, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier, they're empowered to do what they do best, which is to teach. It's just talk about how Lincoln ended the Civil War. Not that he, he ended it with these set of facts, but what drove that, that strategy? What deals did he have to cut in the back rooms to get that done? I mean, that's what's interesting. That's what we learn. That's what we take forward in those types of lessons, not the facts and figures of, of the event. Stephen. And just to add on to that, so it really gets to be how do you start to create the solution? And you really need to put that student in the center and wrap that teacher and tutors and support around them. And then on the side here is a knowledge map. It's an area of expertise you're trying to help the student gain. So we've done this in 1,100 course areas over the past decade. And the key is, number one, this is still about experts in their field. So you have to work with experts in their field to define the knowledge map. Now, the relationship of the concepts in the map is ever changing. There's not one way to go through a knowledge map to become an expert. So you then have to use machine learning to define what these relationships could look like. And they're ever changing. It's not a fixed model. So you've got that on one side. On the other side, you do have the student actively engaging in learning. And logging into the LMS is probably the least useful thing. And we actually don't even have one. Um, it's good for some of these other questions, the bigger questions of, is the student happy on campus? Because a student never logs into an LMS, that is a problem. But it's not a learning problem, it's a social problem, I would argue. So we have the student engaging, we have their, certainly how they're interacting with it, but you also have to stop and ask them, are they confident? How are they feeling about their engagement? When they're engaging in this exercise or this assessment, do they really feel they know the answer, as an example? You also have to understand how a forgetting curve works. How often do I need to refresh and recharge to move from short-term memory to long-term memory? So if you take this knowledge map built by experts but implemented in a probabilistic set of relationships, if you instrument the learning moment to really get at feeling, confidence, as well as mastery, you can then guide the student through this course of inquiry. And we think that's super helpful in addition to some of other the larger data that people have been talking about. I have a very um, philosophical question that somebody sent in via the app. And I have a couple of hands up here, too. So I'm going to read out the one that came in from the app, which is what is the goal of education, success, or freedom, and leave that one sitting there and ask for my two <laughs> perhaps wow. very granular questions here. So can I have a mic here for yeah, these two gentlemen? No, sorry, one lady. Hi, I'm Tony Amater from the University of Mississippi, also known as Ole Miss. Um, I was trying to bring together this conversation of big data with a lot of what we talked about this morning, soft skills. Yes. Yeah. And one of the things that I think of soft skills borrowing from our, our, borrowing from our sociology friends is its a ability to engage in a rational discourse and intellectual discussion in a variety of social situations. To what extent or, or what measures are available uh, through, through through big data means to figure out are our students getting this? Are they learning this? Are they being 
uh, asked to do things that would lead to those skills. Thank you. I'm going to just take the question behind you as well and then come back to my panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Rapkin. I'm chair of a board of a large community college in Canada. Um, and my questions are around uh, recognizing all the promises of, of big data uh, as a, thinking about future, future decisions uh, at that level, at the board level. Uh, our, I'd like to know, uh, hear from the panelists about potential perils of cost. How do you make decisions around that because big data costs? And the other is, are, do you have any concerns around um, cybersecurity in connection with big data? Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to ask about big data and soft skills, big data and costs and security. And I mean, I, I am interested in, you know, what you're if you had to choose between success and freedom, or you know, if, you have some, if, if there's something that bounces off this and resonates with you, I know it's a huge question. That's another false title. <laughs> it is completely. It's. Uh, I would argue that there is much more freedom for the student when they are being successful. So I mean, that's that's an absolute false dichotomy. I believe there as well. Um, getting, getting at the soft skills idea. So some of the things you're seeing around like uh, natural language anal analysis and, and sentiment analysis that you're seeing that has been primarily around the marketing trends in, in the past, I think certainly has a place that can be used in like communication and composition courses that might help guide us in, in terms of, of these efforts. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think there's a, a, a definite path there. Um, try and hit them all at once. Uh, costs, there are things you can do on a, on a small scale that are triggers for students that don't have to involve bringing in a gigantic analytics platform and doing this kind of cost and running a Hadoop server in the background and things of that nature. Um, there are obvious triggers around engagement with the university in terms of whether a student's registering, whether they're logging into the system as, as was talked about. Uh, there are things that an individual instructor can do at a course in terms of looking at their learning outcomes and, and uh, providing much more uh, proximal uh, 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 information back to the student forum that don't have to involve enormous costs at, uh, at this uh, at this scale on it. And security, security is a, a concern on anything with the amount of data we have uh, across campuses. Is something we will always be uh, uh, working with, and the systems that we're pulling from have to have a level of security around them that that gives us comfort. So. Um, just a couple of additions. I totally agree about the success and freedom point. And um, you know, to your point about the social skills, uh, again, I, I think um, imagine a world where we don't have tests. Imagine a world. Well, why do we even have exams and tests? Because we're constantly gra grasping for um, an, a really deep understanding of where students are from a profi proficiency standpoint. And so, you know, these days in, in K-12, I mean, this is, again, not just in this country, but in, in a lot of other countries, they're spending the majority of, of class time preparing for these exams and tests, high stakes exams. I see a world where exams are gone or eliminated because with big data, with the innovations that we have now that we can apply in thoughtful ways in education products that are being used by teachers and being used by students, um, you will know not just every quarter, uh, every fourth of the, of the semester or every, every six weeks, you'll know at any instant where the student is from a proficiency standpoint. Eliminate exams, eliminate testing, high stakes tests altogether, and what would happen? What would happen is you, you would have a much more of a, a higher focus on creativity, I believe, again, discussing higher order problem solving uh, skills because that's what teachers bring. Teachers and, and great instructors bring that higher order thought. They don't want to be teaching base level skills. And, it, and if you spend all your time in that area, and I believe this is where technology can help, I don't think a machine can tell you what the best strategy is in, in, in ending any kind of uh, major uh, conflict in the world. And those things require discussion, require that kind of back and forth that you get between um, you know, people who are thinking at that level. Um, on the, on the, I think somebody had a point about uh, cost and security. Um, we're at a, uh, at a point in history where now we're able to provide this kind of capabilities um, 
at such a low cost. I don't think, I think cost, in fact, is, is going to be one of the, the attributes. Uh, being able to reduce costs in, in bringing this kind of personalized type of learning to students at scale. Um, and we're seeing that now, you know, when we're at tens of millions of students, you're able to um, reduce those types of costs in terms of uh, producing that next recommendation uh, at pennies, you know, and it's happening um, already. So um, we can use technology to our advantage to lower uh, costs. I don't, I don't really believe cost is an issue. And in terms of security, um, you know, we believe, and I, I think my panelists would probably agree, but I wouldn't want to speak for them, that student data belongs to students. Stephen. Bottom line, we are, we are just stewards of that information. And so they should own it. They should be able to take it to wherever they want. We believe also that you have a profile. You have a, a learner profile, which is not like your Facebook profile or your Amazon profile. It is a profile that allows you to uh, increase your chance of success in every education moment that you have going forward. Everyone has that right. Every time we take a new course or of study, why, do we, why are we treated like we were born yesterday from a data perspective? It's outrageous. You're lucky if your teacher talks to the other teacher from the semester before. That's crazy in, t in 2015. Stephen, final remark since we're running out of time. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. So drive us all towards standards, please. Force us all to be open, please. If we don't do that, the cost will be insurmountable. Right? I mean, think back to when we all put technology on our campuses. We all ran mail. We all ha hosted our own LMS. We all had our own SIS, even the same university system. I worked at Harvard. We had 12 of them. It's a different story. So I think this works if we converge on standards and converge on safe interoperability. We do a lot to help drive down the costs. Second point is this does require new pedagogy. It does require re-envisioning why we convene students in a classroom when we do that and to do active learning. So the technology does amazing things in Blooms 1 to 3. As we start getting up higher, as we start, as my panelists said, as we start really trying to take this knowledge that we have and apply it in new and innovative ways, it's, that's still about communities of people doing things together. And so if we're willing to reimagine the classroom, if we're really willing to drive this technology to work across open standards, the results are just going to be, and have proven to be over our decade of experience, simply amazing. Thank and you very much. It's a great moment in time to do it. Thank you to my panelists.